Hi, I'm Old Sneelock. Welcome to another episode of Old Sneelock on the Road. I'm here at Burgess Antique Center, and I'm in the upstairs in the, in the back room and doing a demonstration on how to sharpen a handsaw. Had a lot of people in. Hello. I'm doing a demonstration on how to sharpen a handsaw. Oh, I better bring my son up. I'll, we'll come take a look. Okay. Thank you. Can you show this guy? Sure. He's never seen that. What do you know about handsaws? Uh, not much. Not much? Well, a handsaw is designed to cut wood, obviously. This is considered a rip saw. You know what the difference between a rip and a cross cut is? No. Okay, a rip saw, if you have a two by four and you want to make it into a two by two, you take a rip saw which cuts down the length of the board. The reason that you call this a rip saw instead of a cross cut, a rip saw has a special kind of tooth. Oh. The teeth are like chisels, like beaver teeth. They go in and they just cut the end right out of the board. If you use a cross cut, let me show you what a cross cut looks like compared to this one. This one's smaller. Yeah. Still a cross cut, but it's more your size. They call this a number 28 toolbox. Yeah. That's for regular old carpenters. Big guys like me, we have saws like that too. But they're handy for a guy like you because this thing's heavy. Yeah. Here for the edge, it's really sharp. And this one, you've got enough arm movement that you can run the whole blade. This one, you probably only run about half the blade, so you'd be spending a whole lot of time moving this stuff out here for no good. It's a nice little finger hole there. Too. Yep, they call that a thumb hole rip. Okay. Uh, quite a few companies made them. The idea behind it is, with this big four teeth wrench, it's like trying to take down the whole tree at one pass. So they could put their thumb in here and grab oh, a hold yeah. of the top of the handle and use both hands. With this little saw, if you tried to do that, put this up there. Claire. It would be really hard to have this one do any good because it's going to want to slide off the top. Yeah. You can do it. I mean, you, anything that you really want to try, you can do. But the difference between a cross cut and a rip saw. See how these teeth are angled? Yeah. They're like this. This rip saw is straight across. Yeah. And the reason that these are at an angle, does your dad let you use a jackknife every once in a while? No. <laughs> when you get older, he'll show you. The jackknife cuts because it's got a really nice sharp blade and you push it into the wood and the wood gets sliced away by the, the jackknife blade. With these points on here they act like jackknife blades but instead of having one jackknife trying to cut that tree down or cut up that board and you have to do a whole lot of cuts, this one has 10 jackknife blades per inch. So there's a whole lot of little jackknives. So when you take this saw and run it across it cuts a whole bunch of once. The difference between this and a knife is this one is just a way to mount a whole bunch of knife blades on a piece of steel so you can do them all at once. Yeah. So that's why they're pointed. So sharp. How are you, you're just filing the, the teeth down, filing a sharp edge. Yes, I just finished that one. Okay. I was gonna grab another one out of the box. I brought rip saws because rip saws are easy to sharpen and oh. they're a lot easier to make the demonstration. Sure. Is that a special vise for a saw? Yep, this is called a saw vise. Figures, right? Yeah, it makes sense. 
when you're going to sharpen a saw, there's some tricks that you can do. And if you don't know these tricks, saw sharpening can be really confusing. First thing you want to do, in the old days, they'd take a candle and the candle burns and puts off smoke if you leave the wick really long. So they take a candle with a long wick and it would make a lot of smoke and they would cover the whole group of teeth on the saw blade with soot. I don't want to use a candle so I use this stuff called Dykem. Back when I was a tool maker we use this stuff for everything. And toolmakers being big boys, not much more than that. Everybody thought this was a lot of fun. They, they would play with this. You'd be standing there talking to somebody and somebody would sneak up behind you and paint your fingernails. <laughs> and you wouldn't notice it because that little brush doesn't make any real pressure on your fingernail. So you'd go to scratch your nose and you'd have blue on your finger and blue on your nose. People thought that was a lot of fun. Does it come off? Does oh yeah, alcohol off? takes it right off. Okay. But still, it only comes off if you know it's there. Right. And if you just got done with break and it's another two hours before the next one, nobody's going to tell you. <laughs> right. well. Do you know how old this building is? No, I don't. It's a neat building. Yeah, it used to be a granary, from what I understand. Okay. I like the old Flores Creek when you walk across it. It's mm -hmm. got a lot of character. It's a really stout building, too, because if they had grain bins in here, they had thousands of tons on the floor. Sure. Yeah, that's true. And they're sitting right next to the railroad track, so it was probably easy to get grain in and out of the building. Yeah. Now once we've got the dicom on there, or the soot, then we take a thing called a joiner. And here's where you'll get to learn a little bit about old English. You ever hear somebody say, you got your nose out of joint? That's not a common word. <laughs> Probably know. something that you wouldn't run into. Yeah, your dad would. He'll explain it to you. Yeah. Uh, they were talking about this little piece of equipment that I'm going to show you here in a second. When you're sharpening a saw blade, you want to have all the teeth the same height when you're done. Because if you have one really big tooth, what's that one big tooth going to do? Cut deeper. Yeah. And it's going to be the only one cutting. So instead of having all these little knife blades working for you, you got one. A lot of work. So you take this thing which is called a jointer. And the idea is it takes this little file, which is Sharp one way and I have to always check it because I should put a mark on there so I know which direction it goes, shouldn't I? That would make sense. Take this joiner and you put it on top of the saw blade, it's going to be noisy. And you run it across. Now if you step over here, I'll show you something. If you look at the tips of the teeth, can you see the little shine there? Yeah. Let me drop this down so you can see it better. Yeah, see how the, the tips of those teeth are shiny? Yeah. That one right there isn't. You know why that is? Got cut. It's short. These teeth here are out of joint with that tooth. So if your nose is out of joint, your nose is too high. You're kind of snooty. People don't like you. <laughs> Now, when I'm sharpening the saw, I want to have all these have little shiny dots on them. But if I see one back here that doesn't have a dot, and there's another one right there that doesn't have a dot on it, and one there, it's only three out of this whole saw blade. So it's, it's been around a day or two longer than I have. Not much more than that, but a day or two. I don't want to wear it out. Yeah. My grandfather would have been a baby when this was made. Mm -hmm. so, Rather than taking it down so that the shortest tooth is up and actually working, I'm going to say three tooth take a hiding, you know, take a vacation. They're not really doing anything. Not going to hurt the saw. It's going to get sharpened eventually again, and the next time it's sharpened, 
those teeth will be a little bit taller. The tall ones get short and the short ones end up coming up even with them. Get into a bunch of cows and calves. That hangs on the wall in my workshop at home to remind me never to do that again. <laughs> so I start on this one back here, I do two strokes. Saw blade, as opposed to a 10 tooth per inch saw blade like I, that little saw over there. Yeah. This one only has one and a half, excuse me, one quarter of the teeth that that one does. So anyways, that's what you do. You go along like that. When you get all the way down to the end, you stop, you pick the saw up, you turn it around, you clamp it back into the vise, and you go the other way. You want to bend just the tip. I get teeth, or I get saws I don't anymore because I don't buy them. I used to buy just any old saw I saw laying around because I wanted to practice. And the cheaper the saw was, the less I worried about wrecking it. When you're practicing, it's always good to have something that you don't really care about. Right. So I have saws with the teeth broken off of them. Oh, yeah. And that's because somebody bent the blade bent the tooth clear down at the bottom. You want to just bend the tip. You ever hear of something called a, a thousandth of an inch? Yes. Okay. I want to bend this tooth so that it's five thousandths of an inch further that way than it was when it started. Oh. Just five thousandths. About the thickness of a piece of tablet paper. Tablet paper is four thousandths. What it does, it moves these teeth out far enough that mm. they're taking a lot more wood than what I need to. This saw blade is about 45 thousandths of an inch thick. Five thousandths, that means I've taken 55 thousandths out of the piece of wood that I'm cutting. Not a whole lot of wood that I'm removing. I'm not wasting that wood. I'm not turning it into sawdust. And I don't spend a lot of eff extra effort taking out wood that I don't really want to take out. So. But why would you bend them out like that rather than just leave them up totally straight? Just so you can, it cuts faster. Also, it's good to be a little wider so you can get your saw out if you need to. But he probably knows the right answer. Is that Actually, that's it? absolutely correct. Is it? Okay. You want to have a little clearance so that the blade runs. <coughs> Thank Otherwise you for asking. You might get stuck in the wood. You wouldn't want that. You want to take out a little bit extra. Yep. You want to, there's clearance for this back part of the blade. On the really fancy blades, this is a Distin D8. Distin D8s were kind of a run-of-the-mill workhorse. Very good. I, I really like them. I collect them. If I find a D8, I'm a happy guy. But the D8 was more of a carpenter's saw. Oh. The cabinet makers, cabinet makers worked with really expensive wood, so they didn't want to make sawdust out of it. Oh. They were working with walnut and teak and all kinds of very expensive woods. So they wanted to thin a saw blade as they can get that would still cut. And this didn't made a saw called the 12, number 12. Why he called it number 12, I don't know. It's what he called it, 1850. Go back and ask him, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but what they did is they hollow ground it. You ever seen your mom's paring knives? Paring? Little knife, those little knives she uses to like cut apples. Oh, yeah. Okay, those are hollow ground. The hollow grind means that they, they have the edge thinner than the back. The back has to be thick so it doesn't break, but you want to have the edge as thin as possible so Oops, that it cuts easier. Cut. Yeah. Saw blades exactly backwards to that. They wanted to have the teeth wide so that there was room in the back for the blade to go through. On the number 12, rather than bending the teeth, which makes the saw cut a wider cut, mm -hmm. they just ground the blade down so it was thinner on the back than it is at the blade, mm -hmm. or at the teeth. Very expensive process to do it. They had to have a guy stand there with this big old uh, water wheel. Water wheel, how do I explain that? It's a grindstone about this big around. And he would lay on top of a board over the top of that stone as the stone was turning. The bottom ran through a trough of water and it came up around and he held the blade on that stone and ran that blade back and forth over it. The re reason they had it that big around is so it didn't make a little bitty divot in the side of the uh, blade. They wanted to make a really big, large radius curve. So that's what he would do all day, is lay on that board and run saw blades across mm. it. What a job. Yeah, not one I'd want to do. <laughs> Especially when you're working 12 hour days and getting paid a dollar a day. It's not yeah. good. 1850 a dollar a day was a lot of money, but still, who'd want to do that? Yeah. 
So the number 12 was considered a really high-end saw. I have one of them. I found one at a, a garage sale and I bought it for $10 and I said, holy cow, this wow. is a $120 saw. Very happy, yeah. very happy guy. Yeah. My wife keeps saying, well, why don't you sell it? It's worth $120, but then I wouldn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. That's cool. That's, that's how saw setting works. That's how you file a rip saw. That's how a rip saw works. Any questions? No, not really. You explained it pretty good. Well, thank you. Very good. I understand that I talk a lot, and I hope when I'm talking a lot, I'm actually saying things that are useful to you. That's why I asked you questions. Had a great time at, at Burgess doing the demonstration, but this 15 minutes, that made the whole day worthwhile. If you have any suggestions for a new video, questions about today's video, or any of the other videos on the channel, just drop a note in the comments. You know I read them all. Thanks for watching.